Zachariah Sitchin calendar, absolutely nothing is going to happen. You know, I remember uh, vaguely uh, something about a project looking glass that Bob had talked about and read something about it in these documents, some sort of a, 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 a machine that where you could peek see into back the future. In time. Yeah. See back in time? Could you see forward? Uh, that one was just about seeing seeing back in time. And, and, I, and he, it, there was just another – there were other projects going on. He was in Project Galileo. That was the project, or what it was called then, with the back engineering of the disk. There was another one with a gravity, uh, a beam weapon, I think with a gravity lens, if I remember right, called Project Sidekick. And uh, then the other one was Project Looking at Glass, which was a method of seeing back in time. And again, we think of seeing back time, in time as going back and seeing who shot JFK. Right. But seeing back in time for scientists, just being able to see back two or three seconds could make a big difference. So. All right. Uh, stay with us. More of your questions for Gene Huff and John Lear on Coast to Coast AM. I'm George Knapp. Stick around, everyone. Hey, welcome back, everyone. We're uh, having a conversation with Gene Huff and John Lear about the events of 20 years ago, how this whole Area 51 story got started, uh, getting some interesting uh, personal insight into what it was like to live through those times and some details on things that happened back then uh, that maybe you hadn't heard about before, even though the general story is very familiar. We'll come back and take as many of your calls as we can fit in uh, in the home stretch of this show. Stay with us for more Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back. I'm George Knapp. This is Coast to Coast AM. We are in the home stretch with our guests, Gene Huff and John Lear. We'll get as many of your questions in as we can. We're going to Allentown, Pennsylvania, and Ed is standing by on our wild card line. Hi, Ed. Hi there, George. Good morning. Good morning uh, to you. What's on all, your mind? Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank you, the three of you, for all the work you've done. In, and in this, in this topic, you brought it to reality, to this earth, and you saved Bob Lazar's life, practically. And um, I think that should be, the world should be indebted to you, all three of you, in that sense. And you, uh, a lot for it also, George. Um, a line of levity, 20 years ago, I was watching Joan Rivers on a Tonight Show episode, and she made a UFO joke that I thought was hysterically funny, and I want to share it. Okay. She said, she said you'll never see a UFO land on the Jewish front lawn. And the audience laughed, and she said, because they threw it over. Turn it over to see who manufactured it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I have a question. It's a compound. Um, is Element 115, like, manufactured by any corporation? Is it regulated by the government? And I have another question also after that, if I may. Okay. Gene? I'm ready. Uh, his question is, uh, is Element 115 manufactured by the government or anybody else? I, I think the answer probably is, uh, you know, they, it's made and they tried to synthesize some of it yeah, in a lab. Yeah, if they're synthesizing it, it, it happens in, in labs in government laboratories in Europe and the United States. Uh, you know, they, all, they get their funding from governments. I'm not aware of any private endeavors, but they wouldn't necessarily call me and tell me they were working on it. So I don't know if it's done privately or not. I, I don't think anyone created enough of it to be able to even study it so i, I really don't have an answer yeah i Gene, agree uh, it cannot be uh, it cannot be uh, made it naturally occurring element and that can only occur in large 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 solar systems John, uh, gene wasn't there a time when some one of these labs these heavy ion labs that you referenced earlier they were contacting bob for information about 115 even though you know he's a non-scientist and a phony and all that stuff in the view <laughs> of a lot of people yeah some scientists from Germany, they had about a hundred page formula, literally a hundred pages of a physics formula all about 115. And, uh, you know, it, it was, it was gibberish to me, you know, I mean, I, you know, I was, I was lost. I, I, I joked, I, if I had told Bob, I, if I were him, I'd put time zero equals zero at the end of it. That's how complex it was. And, and our second, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. And, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, there, there are, there are people there are people who firmly believe there's an island of stability, and certainly with isotopes that there will be uh, that, that uh, heavy stable elements do occur elsewhere. Uh, it's just like John said before, the amount of energy, the cost to synthesize it would exhaust the planet. I mean, it'll, it'll never be synthesized in any quantity. What was the second question? Is that caller still there? Guess not. West of the Rockies, uh, Jeff in California. Hi, Jeff. 
calling from Albion, California, and listening on KKOH 780 AM, uh, home of Ross Mitchell out of Reno, Nevada. And, uh, John, I'm curious as to how you came up with the infamous John Lear test and how much of that Bob Lazar was attributable to that. And also, what was your um, opinion of Art Bell's response to that in, in regards to whether he would reveal that as a public official on the veracity of those issues brought up in that John Lear test? Well, actually, it's just something I wrote up based on information I had. What I'm going to have to do is write Disclosure Test 2.0 <laughs> to bring it up to date with things I have learned since then. What's the John Lear test, John? I don't even know. That was a, a disclosure uh, test that I gave to Art Bell several years ago, and it's all over the, the net. It's based on what I thought was going on, and a lot of it was true, but a lot of it uh, was not. And I, like I say, I've got to relate. I've got to write the uh, disclosure 2.0, which I haven't gotten around to yet. <laughs> all right. Well, I look forward to reading that then. Thanks for the call. We're going to go to our first time caller line, Thomas in Michigan. Good morning, Thomas. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Gene, you were um, asking about um, connection with God. If you took a look at the book of Psalms and realized that it's a timeline that has been describing events at a rate of a chapter per year for the last hundred years, I think you'd catch on. Take a look at uh, Psalm 74 where it talks about Leviathan. It was in that year that we get raised the Russian K-129 diesel submarine, which sank in 68. That thing is the Leviathan, and you take a look at Psalm 68, the chariots of God. He's talking uh, about vehicles coming back here to uh, basically stop a war. Those were the year we sank that submarine. We uh, had missile disruptions throughout the entire uh, United States as Russia because uh, they were getting too close. Well, if, if you that ever makes at sense that? to you and you're at peace with it, then you're, you're a lucky man. Okay, well, I think it would be very helpful because, uh, yeah, the Psalms work as a timeline. They explain everything that's going on. We have 9-11 in there. We have the 91 Gulf War in there, World War II, Holocaust, the atomic bomb development in uh, 1945. All the things that you're talking about are being explained to you right out of there. I don't think Gene wants to argue with you, uh, the, the point being that, you know, you're uh, you're good with it, and uh, he sees things differently, but I thank you for the call anyway, Thomas. Thank you. Wild card line, William in Florida. Hi, William. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. My question to uh, all of you, I don't know if it would have come better at the beginning of the show or maybe it's more appropriate at the end. Uh, for years now, as I've, I've observed ufology and the fascination with flying saucers, I always go back to, what's referred to as the original flying saucer sighting by Mr. Kenneth Arnold uh, around Mount Rainier, Washington, June 24, 1947. Um, Mr. Arnold made a comment saying that um, it described a boomerang-shaped object that skipped like a saucer but did not look like a saucer. Flying saucers, from what I've seen, have never been seen prior to him saying flying saucers. And I know several of the gentlemen there are pilots, as am I, and you know that a flying saucer, per se, is a aerodynamically inferior design. Um, if it was a, uh, a good design and it would work aerodynamically, the space shuttle would probably be a flying saucer. I'm very interested in your response to that, and in your opinion, is all this flying saucer stuff, for lack of a better term, um, could it be based on misinformation from the very beginning, from 1947? Well, and first, if, what you're saying isn't true. There are... If you uh, you take a look in in videos and um, books and printed information about uh, things objects in the sky in in antiquity, you know, in centuries past, there are there are saucer shaped objects in in uh, and that people have seen in the sky long before Kenneth Arnold. Yeah, I agree with that. So so what the paradigm you're setting up is not is not correct. The other part of it is, is aerodynamics even a, a factor in uh, building no, a saucer? No, if, if they're not flying through the wind you know, with a winged <laughs> aircraft. I, I mean, the, the, uh, the, I don't want to start a moon argument with John, but the, but the moon rovers didn't look like a, a 747 either. You know what I mean? They weren't flying, flying in air in, in our atmosphere. So, Thanks, William. I appreciate the call. Mike in Indiana, also on a wild card line. Good morning, Mike. Morning, guys. And just to add to that previous caller with the disc shape, uh, take a look at a frisbee. They're, they're round. 
Good point. I got a question for you guys. Um, I don't know if you're going to have an answer for it or not, uh, but you probably will. Who invented nanotechnology? 